Chapter 2. Aerodynamics, Aircraft Assembly, and Rigging. Introduction. Three topics that are directly related to the manufacture, operation, and repair of aircraft are Aerodynamics, Aircraft Assembly, and Rigging. Each of these subject areas, though studied separately, eventually connect to provide a scientific and physical understanding of how an aircraft is prepared for flight. A logical place to start with these three topics is the study of basic aerodynamics. By studying aerodynamics, a person becomes familiar with the fundamentals of aircraft flight. 2-1 Basic Aerodynamics Aerodynamics is the study of the dynamics of gases, the interaction between a moving object and the atmosphere being of primary interest for this handbook. The movement of an object and its reaction to the airflow around it can be seen when watching water passing the bow of a ship. The major difference between water and air is that air is compressible and water is incompressible. The action of the airflow over a body is a large part of the study of aerodynamics. Some common aircraft terms, such as rudder, hull, water line, and keel beam, were borrowed from nautical terms. Many textbooks have been written about the aerodynamics of aircraft flight. It is not necessary for an airframe and power plant A and P mechanic to be as knowledgeable as an aeronautical engineer about aerodynamics. The mechanic must be able to understand the relationships between how an aircraft performs in flight and its reaction to the forces acting on its structural parts. Understanding why aircraft are designed with particular types of primary and secondary control systems and why the surfaces must be aerodynamically smooth becomes essential when maintaining today's complex aircraft. The theory of flight should be described in terms of the laws of flight, because what happens to an aircraft when it flies is not based upon assumptions, but upon a series of facts. Aerodynamics is a study of laws which have been proven to be the physical reasons why an airplane flies. The term aerodynamics is derived from the combination of two Greek words, aero, meaning air, and dyne, meaning force of power. Thus, when aero joins dynamics the result is aerodynamics the study of objects in motion through the air and the forces that produce or change such motion. Aerodynamically, an aircraft can be defined as an object traveling through space that is affected by the changes in atmospheric conditions. As stated another way, aerodynamics covers the relationships between the aircraft, relative wind, and atmosphere. The atmosphere. Before examining the fundamental laws of flight, several basic facts must be considered, namely that an aircraft operates in the air. Therefore, those properties of air that affect the control and performance of an aircraft must be understood. The air in the Earth's atmosphere is composed mostly of nitrogen and oxygen. Air is considered a fluid, because it fits the definition of a substance that has the ability to flow or assume the shape of the container in which it is enclosed. If the container is heated, pressure increases, if cooled, the pressure decreases. The weight of air is heaviest at sea level, where it has been compressed by all of the air above. This compression of air is called atmospheric pressure. Pressure. Atmospheric pressure is usually defined as the force exerted against the Earth's surface by the weight of the air above that surface. Weight is force applied to an area that results in pressure. Force F equals area A times pressure P, or F equals AP. Therefore, to find the amount of pressure, divide area into force P equals F slash A. A column of air one square inch extending from sea level to the top of the atmosphere weighs approximately 14.7 pounds. Therefore, atmospheric pressure is stated in pounds per square inch psi. Thus, atmospheric pressure at sea level is 14.7 psi. Atmospheric pressure is measured with an instrument called a barometer, composed of mercury in a tube that records atmospheric pressure in inches of mercury Hg. Figure 2 one the standard measurement in aviation altimeters in US. Weather reports has been Hg. However, worldwide weather maps and some non-US manufactured aircraft instruments indicate pressure in millibars MB, a metric unit. At sea level, when the average atmospheric pressure is 14.7 psi, the barometric pressure is 29.92 Hg, and the metric measurement is 1013.25 MB. An important consideration is that atmospheric pressure varies with altitude. As an aircraft ascends, atmospheric pressure drops, oxygen content of the air decreases, and temperature drops. The changes in altitude affect an aircraft's performance in such areas as lift and engine horsepower. A. Uh, standard sea level pressure. Inches of mercury. 29.92. 30. 25. 20. 15. 10. 5. 0. Vacuum. Hg 1013. Millibars 1016. 847. 677. 508. 339. 170. 0. Standard sea level pressure. MV. A TMOSPHERICPRESSURE. 1. 1. 1. 0.491 LP mercury. Figure 2 1. Barometer used to measure atmospheric pressure. 2 2. Effects of temperature, altitude, and density of air on aircraft performance are covered in the following paragraphs. Density. Density is weight per unit of volume. Since air is a mixture of gases, it can be compressed. 
If the air in one container is under half as much pressure as an equal amount of air in an identical container, the air under the greater pressure weighs twice as much as that in the container under lower pressure. The air under greater pressure is twice as dense as that in the other container. For the equal weight of air, that which is under the greater pressure occupies only half the volume of that under half the pressure. The density of gases is governed by the following rules. 1. Density varies in direct proportion with the pressure. 2. Density varies inversely with the temperature. Thus, air at high altitudes is less dense than air at low altitudes, and the mass of hot air is less dense than the mass of cool air. Changes in density affect the aerodynamic performance of aircraft with the same horsepower. An aircraft can fly faster at a high altitude, where the density is low than at a low altitude, where the density is greater. This is because air offers less resistance to the aircraft when it contains a smaller number of air particles per unit of volume. Humidity. Humidity is the amount of water vapor in the air. The maximum amount of water vapor that air can hold varies with the temperature. The higher the temperature of the air, the more water vapor it can absorb. 1. Absolute humidity is the weight of water vapor in a unit volume of air. 2. Relative humidity is the ratio, in percent, of the moisture actually in the air to the moisture it would hold if it were saturated at the same temperature and pressure. Assuming that the temperature and pressure remain the same, the density of the air varies inversely with the humidity. On damp days, the air density is less than on dry days. For this reason, an aircraft requires a longer runway for takeoff on damp days than it does on dry days. By itself, water vapor weighs approximately 5 eighths as much as an equal amount of perfectly dry air. Therefore, when air contains water vapor, it is not as heavy as dry air containing no moisture. Aerodynamics and the laws of physics. The law of conservation of energy states that energy may neither be created nor destroyed. Motion is the actor process of changing place or position. An object may be in motion with respect to one object, and motionless with respect to another. For example, a person sitting quietly in an aircraft flying at 200 knots is at rest or motionless with respect to the aircraft. However, the person and the aircraft are in motion with respect to the air and to the earth. Air has no force or power except pressure unless it is in motion. When it is moving, however, its force becomes apparent. A moving object in motionless air has a force exerted on it as a result of its own motion. It makes no difference in the effect then whether an object is moving with respect to the air or the air is moving with respect to the object. The flow of air around an object caused by the movement of either the air or the object, or both, is called the relative wind. Velocity and acceleration. The terms speed and velocity are often used interchangeably, but they do not have the same meaning. Speed is the rate of motion in relation to time, and velocity is the rate of motion in a particular direction in relation to time. An aircraft starts from New York City and flies 10 hours at an average speed of 260 miles per hour mph. At the end of this time, the aircraft may be over the Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, Gulf of Mexico, or, if its flight were in a circular path, it may even be back over New York City. If the same aircraft flew at a velocity of 260 mph in a southwestward direction, it would arrive in Los Angeles in about 10 hours. Only the rate of motion is indicated in the first example and denotes the speed of the aircraft. In the last example, the particular direction is included with the rate of motion, thus denoting the velocity of the aircraft. Acceleration is defined as the rate of change of velocity. An aircraft increasing in velocity is an example of positive acceleration, while another aircraft reducing its velocity is an example of negative acceleration, or deceleration. Newton's Laws of Motion The fundamental laws governing the action of air about the wing are known as Newton's Laws of Motion. Newton's first law is normally referred to as the Law of Inertia. It simply means that a body at rest does not move unless force is applied to it. If a body is moving at uniform, 2 3 speed in a straight line, force must be applied to increase or decrease the speed. According to Newton's law, since air has mass, it is a body. When an aircraft is on the ground with its engines off, inertia keeps the aircraft at rest. An aircraft is moved from its state of rest by the thrust force created by a propeller, or by the expanding exhaust, or both. When an aircraft is flying at uniform speed in a straight line, inertia tends to keep the aircraft moving. Some external force is required to change the aircraft from its path of flight. Newton's second law states that, if a body moving with uniform speed is acted upon by an external force, the change of motion is proportional to the amount of the force, and motion takes place in the direction in which the force acts. This law may be stated mathematically as follows. Force equals mass times acceleration F equals ma. If an aircraft is flying against a headwind, it is slowed down. If the wind is coming from either side of the aircraft's heading, the aircraft is pushed off course unless the pilot takes corrective action against the wind direction. Newton's third law is the law of action and reaction. This law states that for every action force there is an equal and opposite reaction force. This law can be illustrated by the example of firing a gun. The action is the forward movement of the bullet, while the reaction is the backward recoil of the gun. The three laws of motion that have been discussed apply to the theory of flight. 
In many cases, all three laws may be operating on an aircraft at the same time. Bernoulli's principle and subsonic flow. Bernoulli's principle states that when the fluid air flowing through a tube reaches a constriction, or narrowing, of the tube, the speed of the fluid flowing through that constriction is increased and its pressure is decreased. The camera curved surface of an airfoil wing affects the airflow exactly as a constriction in the tube affects airflow. Figure 2 2 diagram A of figure 2 2 illustrates the effect of air passing through a constriction in the tube. In diagram B, air is flowing past a camera surface, such as an airfoil, and the effect is similar to that of air passing through a restriction. As the air flows over the upper surface of an airfoil, its velocity increases and its pressure decreases, an area of low pressure is formed. There is an area of greater pressure on the lower surface of the airfoil, and this greater pressure tends to move the wing upward. The difference in pressure between the upper and lower surfaces of the wing is called lift. Three-fourths of the total lift of an airfoil is the result of the decrease in pressure over the upper surface. The impact of air on the undersurface of an airfoil reduces the other one-fourth of the total lift. Airfoil. An airfoil is a surface designed to obtain lift from the air through which it moves. Thus, it can be stated that any part of the aircraft that converts air resistance into lift is an airfoil. A. Mass of air. Normal pressure. Same mass of air. Velocity increased pressure decreased compared to original. Normal pressure. B. Normal flow increased flow normal flow. Figure 2 2. Bernoulli's principle. 2 4. The profile of a conventional wing is an excellent example of an airfoil. Figure 2 3 notice that the top surface of the wing profile has greater curvature than the lower surface. The difference in curvature of the upper and lower surfaces of the wing builds up the lift force. Air flowing over the top surface of the wing must reach the trailing edge of the wing in the same amount of time as the air flowing under the wing. To do this, the air passing over the top surface moves at a greater velocity than the air passing below the wing, because of the greater distance it must travel along the top surface. This increased velocity, according to Bernoulli's principle, means a corresponding decrease in pressure on the surface. Thus, a pressure differential is created between the upper and lower surfaces of the wing, forcing the wing upward in the direction of the lower pressure. Within limits, lift can be increased by increasing the angle of attack AOA, wing area, velocity, density of the air, or by changing the shape of the airfoil. When the force of lift on an aircraft's wing equals the force of gravity, the aircraft maintains level flight. Shape of the airfoil. Individual airfoil section properties differ from those properties of the wing or aircraft as a whole, because of the effect of the wing platform. A wing may have various airfoil sections from root to tip, with taper, twist, and sweep back. The resulting aerodynamic properties of the wing are determined by the action of each section along the span. The shape of the airfoil determines the amount of turbulence or skin friction that it produces, consequently affecting the efficiency of the wing. Turbulence and skin friction are controlled mainly by the fineness ratio, which is defined as the ratio of the cord of the airfoil to the maximum thickness. If the wing has a high fineness ratio, it is a very thin wing. A thick wing has a low fineness ratio. A wing with a high fineness ratio produces a large amount of skin friction. A wing with a low fineness ratio produces a large amount of turbulence. The best wing is a compromise between these two extremes to hold both turbulence and skin friction to a minimum. The efficiency of a wing is measured in terms of the lift to drag ratio L slash D. This ratio varies with the AOA, but reaches a definite maximum value for a particular AOA. At this angle, the wing has reached its maximum efficiency. The shape of the airfoil is the factor that determines the AOA at which the wing is most efficient. It also determines the degree of efficiency. Research has shown that the most efficient airfoils for general use have the maximum thickness occurring about one-third of the way back from the leading edge of the wing. High lift wings and high lift devices for wings have been developed by shaping the airfoils to produce the desired effect. The amount of lift produced by an airfoil increases with an increase in wing hammer. Hammer refers to the curvature of an airfoil above and below the cord line surface. Upper camera refers to the upper surface, lower camera to the lower surface, and mean camera to the mean line of the section. Camera is positive when departure from the cord line is outward and negative when it is inward. Thus, high lift wings have a large positive camera on the upper surface, and a slightly negative camera on the lower surface. Wing flaps cause an ordinary wing to approximate the same condition, by increasing the upper camera, and by creating a negative lower camera. It is also known, that the larger the wingspan, as compared to the cord, the greater the lift obtained. This comparison is called aspect ratio. The higher the aspect ratio, the greater the lift. In spite of the benefits from an increase in aspect ratio, it was found that definite limitations were defined by structural and drag considerations. On the other hand, an airfoil that is perfectly streamlined and offers little wind resistance sometimes does not have enough lifting power to take the aircraft off the ground. Thus, modern aircraft have airfoils which strike a medium between extremes, the shape depending on the purposes of the aircraft for which it is designed. Angle of Incidence the acute angle the wind coordinates with the longitudinal axis of the aircraft is called the angle of incidence, or the angle of wind setting. 
Figure 2 for the angle of incidence in most. 115 mph 14.54 lb slash and 2. Angle of incidence. Longitudinal axis. Ford line of wind. 100 mph 14.7 lb slash and 2. 105 mph 14.67 lb slash and 2. Figure 2 3. Airflow over a wind section. Figure 2 4. Angle of incidence. 2 5. Aces is a fixed, built in angle. When the leading edge of the wing is higher than the trailing edge, the angle of incidence is said to be positive. The angle of incidence is negative when the leading edge is lower than the trailing edge of the wing. Angle of attack AOA. Before beginning the discussion on AOA and its effect on airfoils, first consider the terms cord and center of pressure CP as illustrated in figure 2-5. The cord of an airfoil or wing section is an imaginary straight line that passes through the section from the leading edge to the trailing edge, as shown in figure 2-5. The cord line provides one side of an angle that ultimately forms the AOA. The other side of the angle is formed by a line indicating the direction of the relative airstream. Thus, AOA is defined as the angle between the cord line of the wing and the direction of the relative wind. This is not to be confused with the angle of incidence, illustrated in figure 2-4, which is the angle between the cord line of the wing and the longitudinal axis of the aircraft. On each part of an airfoil or wing surface, a small force is present. This force is of a different magnitude and direction from any forces acting on other areas forward, or rearward from this point. It is possible to add all of these small forces mathematically. That sum is called the resultant force lift. This resultant force has magnitude, direction, and location, and can be represented as a vector, as shown in figure 2-5. The point of intersection of the resultant force line with the cord line of the airfoil is called the center of pressure CP. The CP moves along the airfoil cord as the AOA changes. Throughout most of the flight range, the CP moves forward with increasing AOA and rearward as the AOA decreases. The effect of increasing AOA on the CP is shown in figure 2-6. The AOA changes as the aircraft's attitude changes. Since the AOA has a great deal to do with determining lift, it is given primary consideration when designing airfoils. In a properly designed airfoil, the lift increases as the AOA is increased. Angle of attack. Resultant lift. Ford line. Lift. Relative airstream drag. Center of pressure. Figure 2-5. Airflow over a wing section. The angle of attack equals zero degrees. Resultant. Negative pressure pattern. Relative airstream. Positive pressure center of pressure. The angle of attack equals six degrees. Resultant. Negative pressure pattern moves forward. Relative airstream. Positive pressure. See angle of attack equals 12 degrees. Resultant. Relative airstream. Center of pressure moves forward. Positive pressure. The angle of attack equals 18 degrees. When completely stalled. Positive pressure. Figure 2-6. Effect on increasing angle of attack. When the AOA is increased gradually toward a positive AOA, the lift component increases rapidly up to a certain point and then suddenly begins to drop off. During this action the drag component increases slowly at first, then rapidly as lift begins to drop off. When the AOA increases to the angle of maximum lift, the purple point is reached. This is known as the critical angle. When the critical angle is reached, the air ceases to flow smoothly over the top surface of the airfoil and begins to purple already. This means that air breaks away from the upper camera line of the wing. What was formerly the area of decreased pressure is now filled by this purpling air. When this occurs, the amount of lift drops and drag becomes. 2-6. Excessive. The force of gravity exerts itself, and the nose of the aircraft drops. This is a stall. Thus, the purple point is the stalling angle. As previously seen, the distribution of the pressure forces over the airfoil varies with the AOA. The application of the resultant force, or CP, varies correspondingly. As this angle increases, the CP moves forward. As the angle decreases, the CP moves back. The unstable travel of the CP is characteristic of almost all airfoils. Boundary layer. In the study of physics and fluid mechanics, a boundary layer is that layer of fluid in the immediate vicinity of a bounding surface. In relation to an aircraft, the boundary layer is the part of the airflow closest to the surface of the aircraft. In designing high-performance aircraft, considerable attention is paid to controlling the behavior of the boundary layer to minimize pressure drag and skin friction drag. Thrust and drag. An aircraft in flight is the center of a continuous battle of forces. Actually, this conflict is not as violent as it sounds, but it is the key to all maneuvers performed in the air. There is nothing mysterious about these forces, they are definite and known. The directions in which they act can be calculated, and the aircraft itself is designed to take advantage of each of them. In all types of flying, flight calculations are based on the magnitude and direction of four forces. Weight, lift, drag, and thrust. Figure 2-7. An aircraft in flight is acted upon by four forces. 1. Gravity or weight the force that pulls the aircraft toward the Earth. Weight is the force of gravity acting downward upon everything that goes into the aircraft, such as the aircraft itself, crew, fuel, and cargo. Lift. 
2. Lift the force that pushes the aircraft upward. Lift acts vertically and counteracts the effects of weight. 3. Thrust the force that moves the aircraft forward. Thrust is the forward force produced by the power plant that overcomes the force of drag. 4. Drag the force that exerts a braking action to hold the aircraft back. Drag is a backward deterrent force and is caused by the disruption of the airflow by the wings, fuselage, and protruding objects. These four forces are in perfect balance only when the aircraft is in straight and level and accelerated flight. The forces of lift and drag are the direct result of the relationship between the relative wind and the aircraft. The force of lift always acts perpendicular to the relative wind, and the force of drag always acts parallel to and in the same direction as the relative wind. These forces are actually the components that produce a resultant lift force on the wing. Figure 2 8. Weight has a definite relationship with lift and thrust with drag. These relationships are quite simple, but very important in understanding the aerodynamics of flying. As stated previously, lift is the upward force on the wing perpendicular to the relative wind. Lift is required to counteract the aircraft's weight, caused by the force of gravity acting on the mass of the aircraft. This weight force acts downward through a point, called the center of gravity CG. The CG is the point at which all the weight of the aircraft is considered to be concentrated. When the lift force is in equilibrium with the weight force, the aircraft neither gains nor loses altitude. If lift becomes less than weight, the aircraft loses altitude. When the lift is greater than the weight, the aircraft gains altitude. Wing area is measured in square feet and includes the part length out by the fuselage. Wing area is adequately described as the area of the shadow cast by the wing at high noon. Tests show that lift and drag forces acting on the wing are roughly proportional to the wing area. This means that resultant drag thrust, lift, weight, figure 27, forces in action during flight, drag, figure 28, resultant of lift and drag, 27. If the wing area is doubled, all other variables remaining the same, the lift and drag created by the wing is doubled. If the area is tripled, lift and drag are tripled. Drag must be overcome for the aircraft to move, and movement is essential to obtain lift. To overcome drag and move the aircraft forward, another force is essential. This force is thrust. Thrust is derived from jet propulsion, or from a propeller and engine combination. Jet propulsion theory is based on Newton's third law of motion page 2-4. The turbine engine causes a mass of air to be moved backward at high velocity causing a reaction that moves the aircraft forward. In a propeller-slash-engine combination, the propeller is actually two or more revolving airfoils mounted on the horizontal shaft. The motion of the blades through the air produces lift similar to the lift on the wing, but acts in a horizontal direction, pulling the aircraft forward. Before the aircraft begins to move, thrust must be exerted. The aircraft continues to move and gain speed until thrust and drag are equal. In order to maintain a steady speed, Thrust and drag must remain equal, just as lift, and weight must be equal for steady, horizontal flight. Increasing the lift means that the aircraft moves upward, whereas decreasing the lift so that it is less than the weight causes the aircraft to lose altitude. A similar rule applies to the two forces of thrust and drag. If the revolutions per minute RPM of the engine is reduced, the thrust is lessened, and the aircraft slows down. As long as the thrust is less than the drag, the aircraft travels more and more slowly until its speed is insufficient to support it in the air. Likewise, if the RPM of the engine is increased, thrust becomes greater than drag, and the speed of the aircraft increases. As long as the thrust continues to be greater than the drag, the aircraft continues to accelerate. When drag equals thrust, the aircraft flies at a steady speed. The relative motion of the air over an object that produces lift also produces drag. Drag is the resistance of the air to objects moving through it. If an aircraft is flying on the level course, the lift force acts vertically to support it, while the drag force acts horizontally to hold it back. The total amount of drag on an aircraft is made up of many drag forces, but this handbook considers three. Parasite drag, profile drag, and induced drag. Parasite drag is made up of a combination of many different drag forces. Any exposed object on an aircraft offers some resistance to the air, and the more objects in the airstream, the more parasite drag. While parasite drag can be reduced by reducing the number of exposed parts to as few as practical and streamlining their shape, skin friction is a type of parasite drag most difficult to reduce. No surface is perfectly smooth. Even machine surfaces have a ragged uneven appearance when inspected under magnification. These ragged surfaces deflect the air near the surface causing resistance to smooth airflow. Skin friction can be reduced by using glossy smooth finishes and eliminating protruding rivet heads, roughness, and other irregularities. Profile drag may be considered the parasite drag of the airfoil. The various components of parasite drag are all of the same nature as profile drag. The action of the airfoil that creates lift also causes induced drag. Remember, the pressure above the wing is less than atmospheric pressure, and the pressure below the wing is equal to or greater than atmospheric pressure. 
Since fluids always move from high pressure toward low pressure, there is a spanwise movement of air from the bottom of the wing outward from the fuselage, and upward around the wing tip. This flow of air results in spillage over the wing tip, thereby setting up a whirlpool of air called a vortex. Figure 2-9. The air on the upper surface has a tendency to move in toward the fuselage and off the trailing edge. This air current forms a similar vortex at the inner portion of the trailing edge of the wing. These vortices increase drag, because of the turbulence produced, and constitute induced drag. Just as lift increases with an increase in AOA, induced drag also increases as the AOA becomes greater. This occurs because, as the AOA is increased, the pressure difference between the top and bottom of the wing becomes greater. This causes more violent vortices to be set up, resulting in more turbulence and more induced drag. Vortex. Figure 2-9. Wingtip vortices. 2-8. Center of gravity CG. Gravity is the pulling force that tends to draw all bodies within the Earth's gravitational field to the center of the Earth. The CG may be considered the point at which all the weight of the aircraft is concentrated. If the aircraft were supported at its exact CG, it would balance in any position. CG is of major importance in an aircraft, for its position has a great bearing upon stability. The CG is determined by the general design of the aircraft. The designers estimate how far the CP travels. They then fix the CG in front of the CP for the corresponding flight speed, in order to provide an adequate restoring moment for flight equilibrium. The axis of an aircraft. Whenever an aircraft changes its attitude in flight, it must turn about one or more of three axes. Figure 210 shows the three axes, which are imaginary lines passing through the center of the aircraft. The axes of an aircraft can be considered as imaginary axles around which the aircraft turns like a wheel. At the center, where all three axes intersect, each is perpendicular to the other two. The axis that extends lengthwise through the fuselage from the nose to the tail is called the longitudinal axis. The axis that extends crosswise from wingtip to wingtip is the lateral, or pitch, axis. The axis that passes through the center, from top to bottom, is called the vertical, or yaw, axis. Roll, pitch, and yaw are controlled by three control surfaces. Roll is produced by the ailerons, which are located at the trailing edges of the wings. Pitch is affected by the elevators, the rear portion of the horizontal tail assembly. Yaw is controlled by the rudder, the rear portion of the vertical tail assembly. Stability and control. An aircraft must have sufficient stability to maintain a uniform flight path and recover from the various upsetting forces. Also, to achieve the best performance, the aircraft must have the proper response to the movement of the controls. Control is the pilot action of moving the flight controls, providing the aerodynamic force that induces the aircraft to follow a desired flight path. When an aircraft is said to be controllable, it means that the aircraft responds easily and promptly to movement of the controls. Different control surfaces are used to control the aircraft about each of the three axes. Moving the control surfaces on an aircraft changes the airflow over the aircraft's surface. This, in turn, creates changes in the balance of forces acting to keep the aircraft flying straight and level. Three terms that appear in any discussion of stability and control are stability, maneuverability, and controllability. Stability is the characteristic of an aircraft that tends to cause it to fly hands off in a straight and level flight path. Maneuverability is the characteristic of an aircraft to be directed along a desired flight path and to withstand the stresses imposed. Controllability is the quality of the response of an aircraft to the pilot's commands while maneuvering the aircraft. Static stability. An aircraft is in a state of equilibrium when the sum of all the forces acting on the aircraft and all the moments is equal to zero. An aircraft in equilibrium experiences no accelerations, and the aircraft continues in a steady condition of flight. A gust of wind or a deflection of the controls disturbs the equilibrium, and the aircraft experiences acceleration due to the unbalance of moment or force. The three types of static stability are defined by the character of movement following some disturbance from equilibrium. Positive static stability exists when the disturbed object tends to return to equilibrium. Negative static stability, or static instability, exists when the disturbed object tends to continue in the direction of disturbance. Neutral static stability exists when the disturbed object has neither tendency, but remains in equilibrium in the direction of disturbance. These three types of stability are illustrated in Figure 211. Dynamic stability. While static stability deals with the tendency of a displaced body to return to equilibrium, dynamic stability deals with the resulting motion with time. If an object is disturbed from equilibrium, the time history of the resulting motion defines the dynamic stability of the object. In general, an object demonstrates positive dynamic stability if the amplitude of motion decreases with time. If the amplitude of motion increases with time, the object is said to possess dynamic instability. Any aircraft must demonstrate the required degrees of static and dynamic stability. If an aircraft were designed with static instability and a rapid rate of dynamic instability, the aircraft would be very difficult, if not impossible, to fly. Usually, positive dynamic stability is required in an aircraft designed to prevent objectionable continued oscillations of the aircraft. 
longitudinal stability. When an aircraft has a tendency to keep a constant AOA with reference to the relative wind IE, it does not tend to put its nose down and dive or lift its nose and stall. It is said to have longitudinal stability. Longitudinal stability refers to 9. Lateral axis. Elevator aileron. Rudder. Aileron. Longitudinal axis. Vertical axis. Normal altitude. Longitudinal axis. B. A bank and roll control affected by aileron movement. Climb and dive pitch control affected by elevator C directional yaw control affected by rudder movement movement. Normal altitude. Lateral axis. Vertical axis. Normal altitude. Figure 210. Motion of an aircraft about its axis. The motion and pitch. The horizontal stabilizer is the primary surface which controls longitudinal stability. The action of the stabilizer depends upon the speed and AOA of the aircraft. Directional stability. Stability about the vertical axis is referred to as directional stability. The aircraft should be designed so that when it is 210. Positive static stability, neutral static stability, negative static stability. Applied force. Applied force. Applied force. CG. 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 Figure 211. Three types of stability. In straight and level flight it remains on its course heading even though the pilot takes his or her hands and feet off the controls. If an aircraft recovers automatically from a skid, it has been well designed for directional balance. The vertical stabilizer is the primary surface that controls directional stability. Directional stability can be designed into an aircraft, where appropriate, by using a large dorsal fin, a long fuselage, and swept back wings. Lateral stability. Motion about the aircraft's longitudinal fore and aft axis is a lateral, or rolling, motion. The tendency to return to the original attitude from such motion is called lateral stability. Dutch roll. A Dutch roll is an aircraft motion consisting of an out-office combination of yaw and roll. Dutch roll stability can be artificially increased by the installation of a yaw damper. Primary flight controls. The primary controls are the ailerons, elevator, and the rudder, which provide the aerodynamic force to make the aircraft follow a desired flight path. Figure 210 The flight control surfaces are hinged, or movable airfoils designed to change the attitude of the aircraft by changing the airflow over the aircraft's surface during flight. These surfaces are used for moving the aircraft about its three axes. Typically, the ailerons and elevators are operated from the flight deck by means of a control stick, a wheel, and yoke assembly, and on some of the newer design aircraft, a joint stick. The rudder is normally operated by foot pedals on most aircraft. Lateral control is the banking movement or roll of an aircraft that is controlled by the ailerons. Longitudinal control is the climb and dive movement or pitch of an aircraft that is controlled by the elevator. Directional control is the left and right movement or yaw of an aircraft that is controlled by the rudder. Trim controls. Included in the trim controls are the trim tabs, servo tabs, balance tabs, and spring tabs. Trim tabs are small airfoils recessed into the trailing edges of the primary control surfaces. Figure 212 trim tabs can be used to correct any tendency of the aircraft to move toward an undesirable flight. Trim tabs. Figure 212. Trim tabs. 211. Attitude. Their purpose is to enable the pilot to trim out any unbalanced condition which may exist during flight without exerting any pressure on the primary controls. Servo tabs, sometimes referred to as flight tabs, are used primarily on the large main control surfaces. They aid in moving the main control surface and holding it in the desired position. Only the servo tab moves in response to movement by the pilot of the primary flight controls. Balance tabs are designed to move in the opposite direction of the primary flight control. Thus, aerodynamic forces acting on the tab assist in moving the primary control surface. Spring tabs are similar in appearance to trim tabs, but serve an entirely different purpose. Spring tabs are used for the same purpose as hydraulic actuators, to aid the pilot in moving the primary control surface. Figure 213 indicates how each trim tab is hinged to its parent primary control surface, but is operated by an independent control. Auxiliary lift devices. Included in the auxiliary lift devices group of flight control surfaces are the wing flaps, spoilers, speed brakes, slats, leading edge flaps, and slots. The auxiliary groups may be divided into two subgroups. Those whose primary purpose is lift augmenting, and those whose primary purpose is lift decreasing. In the first group are the flaps, both trailing edge and leading edge slats, and slots. The lift decreasing devices are speed brakes and spoilers. Lift augmenting. Flaps are located on the trailing edge of the wing, and are movable to increase the wing area, thereby increasing lift on takeoff, and decreasing the speed during landing. These airfoils are retractable, and fair into the wing contour. Others are simply a portion of the lower skin which extends into the airstream, thereby slowing the aircraft. Leading edge flaps, also referred to as slats, are airfoils extended from and retracted into the leading edge of the wing. 
Some installations create a slot and opening between the extended airfoil and the leading edge. Figure 214 at low airspeeds. This slot increases lift and improves handling characteristics, allowing the aircraft to be controlled at airspeeds below the normal landing speed. Other installations have permanent slots built in the leading edge of the wing. At cruising speeds, the trailing edge and leading edge flaps slats are retracted into the wing proper. Slats are movable control surfaces attached to the leading. Control on. Fixed surface. Tab. Control surface. Trim tab. Form free to pivot on hinge axis. Servo tab. Control horn. Balance tab. Control horn. String cartridge. String tab. Figure 213. Types of trim tabs. Edges of the wings. When the slat is closed, it forms the leading edge of the wing. When in the open position extended forward, a slot is created between the slat and the wing leading edge. At low air speeds, this increases lift and improves handling characteristics, allowing the aircraft to be controlled at air speeds below the normal landing speed. Figure 215. Lift decreasing. Lift decreasing devices are the speed brakes spoilers. In some installations, there are two types of spoilers. The ground spoiler is extended only after the aircraft is on the ground, thereby assisting in the braking action. The flight spoiler assists in lateral control by being extended whenever the aileron on that wing is rotated up. When actuated at speed brakes, the spoiler panels on both wings raise up. And flight spoilers may also be located along the sides, underneath the fuselage, or back at the tail. Figure 216 and some aircraft designs, the wing panel on the up aileron side rises more than 212. Basic section. Plane flap. Split flap. Slotted flap. Fowler flap. Figure 216. Speed brake. The wing panel on the down aileron side. This provides speed brake operation and lateral control simultaneously. Winglets. Winglets are the near vertical extension of the wingtip that reduces the aerodynamic drag associated with vortices that develop at the wingtips as the airplane moves through the air. By reducing the induced drag at the tips of the wings, fuel consumption goes down and range is extended. Figure 217 shows an example of a Learjet 60 with winglets. Canard wings. A canard wing aircraft is an airframe configuration of a fixed wing aircraft in which a small wing or horizontal airfoil is ahead of the main lifting surfaces, rather than behind them, as in a conventional aircraft. The canard may be fixed, movable, or designed with elevators. Good examples of aircraft with canard wings are the Rutan Varies and Beechcraft 2000. Starship. Figures 218 and 219. Slotted Fowler Flap. Figure 214. Types of wing flaps. Fixed slot. Slat. Automatic slot. Figure 217. Winglets on the Bombardier Learjet 60. Figure 215. Wing slots. 213. Figure 218. Canard wings on the Rutan Varies. Figure 219. The Beechcraft 2000 Starship has canard wings. Wing fences. Wing fences are flat metal vertical plates fixed to the upper surface of the wing. They obstruct spanwise airflow along the wing, and prevent the entire wing from stalling at once. They are often attached on swept wing aircraft to prevent the spanwise movement of air at high AOA. Their purpose is to provide better slow speed handling and stall characteristics. Figure 220. Control systems for large aircraft. Mechanical control. This is the basic type of system that was used to control early aircraft and is currently used in smaller aircraft where aerodynamic forces are not excessive. The controls are mechanical and manually operated. The mechanical system of controlling an aircraft can include cables, push-pull tubes, and torque tubes. The cable system is the most widely used, because deflections of the structure to which it is attached, do not affect its operation. Some aircraft incorporate control systems, that are a combination of all three. These systems incorporate cable assemblies, cable guides, linkage, adjustable stops, and control surface snubber or mechanical locking devices. These surface locking devices, usually referred to as a gust lock, limits the external wind forces from damaging the aircraft, while it is parked or tied down. Hydromechanical control. As the size, complexity, and speed of aircraft increased, actuation of controls in flight became more difficult. It soon became apparent that the pilot needed assistance to overcome the aerodynamic forces to control aircraft movement. Spring tabs, which were operated by the conventional control system, were moved so that the airflow over them actually moved the primary control surface. This was sufficient for the aircraft operating in the lowest of the high speed ranges 250-300 mph. For higher speeds, a power-assisted hydraulic control system was designed. Conventional cable or push-pull tube systems link the flight deck controls with the hydraulic system. With the system activated, the pilot's movement of a control causes the mechanical link to open servo valves, thereby directing hydraulic fluid to actuators, which convert hydraulic pressure into control surface movements. Because of the efficiency of the hydromechanical flight control system, the aerodynamic forces on the control surfaces cannot be felt by the pilot, and there is a risk of overstressing the structure of the aircraft. 
To overcome this problem, aircraft designers incorporated artificial fuel systems into the design that provided increased resistance to the controls at higher speeds. Additionally, some aircraft with hydraulically powered control systems are fitted with a device called a stick shaper, which provides an artificial stall warning to the pilot. Fly-by-wire control. The fly-by-wire FDW control system employs electrical signals that transmit the pilot's actions from the flight deck. Figure 220. Aircraft stall fence. 214. Through a computer to the various flight control actuators. The FDW system evolved as a way to reduce the system weight of the hydromechanical system, reduce maintenance costs, and improve reliability. Electronic FDW control systems can respond to changing aerodynamic conditions by adjusting flight control movements so that the aircraft response is consistent for all flight conditions. Additionally, the computers can be programmed to prevent undesirable and dangerous characteristics, such as stalling and spinning. Many of the new military high-performance aircraft are not aerodynamically stable. This characteristic is designed into the aircraft for increased maneuverability and responsive performance. Without the computers reacting to the instability, the pilot would lose control of the aircraft. The Airbus A320 was the first commercial airliner to use FDW controls. Boeing used them in their 777 and newer design commercial aircraft. The Dassault Falcon 7X was the first business jet to use a FDW control system. High-speed aerodynamics. High-speed aerodynamics, often called compressible aerodynamics, is a special branch of study of aeronautics. It is utilized by aircraft designers when designing aircraft capable of speeds approaching Mach 1 and above. Because it is beyond the scope and intent of this handbook, only a brief overview of the subject is provided. In the study of high-speed aeronautics, the compressibility effects on air must be addressed. This flight regime was characterized by the Mach number, a special parameter named in honor of Ernst Mach, the late 19th century physicist who studied gas dynamics. Mach number is the ratio of the speed of the aircraft to the local speed of sound, and determines the magnitude of many of the compressibility effects. As an aircraft moves through the air, the air molecules near the aircraft are disturbed and move around the aircraft. The air molecules are pushed aside much like a boat creates a bow wave as it moves through the water. If the aircraft passes at a low speed, Typically less than 250 mph, the density of the air remains constant. But at higher speeds, some of the energy of the aircraft goes into compressing the air and locally changing the density of the air. The bigger and heavier the aircraft, the more air it displaces, and the greater effect compression has on the aircraft. This effect becomes more important as speed increases. Here and beyond the speed of sound, about 760 mph at sea level, sharp disturbances generate a shockwave that affects both the lift and drag of an aircraft and flow conditions downstream of the shockwave. The shockwave forms a cone of pressurized air molecules which move outward and rearward in all directions and extend to the ground. The sharp release of the pressure after the buildup by the shockwave is heard as the sonic boom. Figure 221. Listed below are a range of conditions that are encountered by aircraft as their design speed increases. Subsonic conditions occur for Mach numbers less than 1 100 350 mph. For the lowest subsonic conditions, compressibility can't be ignored. As the speed of the object approaches the speed of sound, the flight Mach number is nearly equal to 1, m equals 1 350 760 mph, and the flow is said to be transonic. At some locations on the object, the local speed of air exceeds the speed of sound. Compressibility effects are most important in transonic flows and lead to the early belief in the sound barrier. Flight faster than sound was thought to be impossible. In fact, the sound barrier was only an increase in the drag near sonic conditions because of compressibility effects. Because of the high drag associated with compressibility effects, aircraft are not operated in cruise conditions near Mach 1. Supersonic conditions occur for numbers greater than Mach 1, but less than Mach 3 762,280 mph. Compressibility effects of gas are important in the design of supersonic aircraft because of the shock waves that are generated by the surface of the object. For high supersonic speeds, between Mach 3 and Mach 5 2283600 mph, aerodynamic heating becomes a very important factor in aircraft design. For speeds greater than Mach 5, the flow is said to be hypersonic. At these speeds, some of the energy of the object now goes into exciting the chemical bonds which hold together the nitrogen and oxygen molecules of the air. At hypersonic speeds, the uh, Figure 221. Breaking the sound barrier. 215. Chemistry of the air must be considered when determining forces on the object. When the space shuttle re-enters the atmosphere at high hypersonic speeds, close to Mach 25, the heated air becomes an ionized plasma of gas, and the spacecraft must be insulated from the extremely high temperatures. Additional technical information pertaining to high-speed aerodynamics can be found at bookstores, libraries, and numerous sources on the internet. 
as the design of aircraft evolves and the speeds of aircraft continue to increase into the hypersonic range, new materials and propulsion systems will need to be developed. This is the challenge for engineers, physicists, and designers of aircraft in the future. Rotary wing aircraft assembly and rigging. The flight control units located in the flight deck of all helicopters are very nearly the same. All helicopters have either one or two of each of the following. Collective pitch control, throttle grip, cyclic pitch control, and directional control pedals. Figure 222 basically, these units do the same things, regardless of the type of helicopter on which they are installed. However, the operation of the control system varies greatly by helicopter model. Rigging the helicopter coordinates the movements of the flight controls and establishes the relationship between the main rotor and its controls, and between the tail rotor and its controls. Rigging is not a difficult job, but it requires great precision and attention to detail. Strict adherence to rigging procedures described in the manufacturer's maintenance manuals and service instructions is a must. Adjustments, clearances, and tolerances must be exact. Rigging of the various flight control systems can be broken down into the following three major steps. 1. Placing the control system in a specific position holding it in position with pins, lamps, or jigs, and adjusting the various linkages to fit the immobilized control component. Two. Placing the control surfaces in a specific reference position using a rigging jig, a precision bubble protractor, or a spirit level to check the angular difference between the control surface and some fixed surface on the aircraft. Figure 223. 3. Setting the maximum range of travel of the various components This adjustment limits the physical movement of the control system. Cyclic control stick. Controls attitude and direction of flight. Throttle. Controls RPM. Collective pitch stick. Controls altitude. Pedals. Maintain heading. Figure 222. Controls of a helicopter and the principal function of each. 216. Main rotor rigging protractor. Caution. Make sure plate dampers are positioned against auto rotation inboard stops. 25 degrees, 20 degrees, 15 degrees, 10 degrees. 5 degrees, 0 degrees. 5 degrees, 10 degrees, 15 degrees. Figure 223. A typical rigging protractor. After completion of the static rigging, a functional check of the flight control system must be accomplished. The nature of the functional check varies with the type of helicopter and system concerned, but usually includes determining that. 1. The direction of movement of the main and tail rotor blades is correct in relation to movement of the pilot's controls. 2. The operation of interconnected control systems engine throttle and collective pitch is properly coordinated. 3. The range of movement and neutral position of the pilot's controls are correct. 4. The maximum and minimum pitch angles of the main rotor blades are within specified limits. This includes checking the fore and aft and lateral cyclic pitch and collective pitch blade angles. 5. The tracking of the main rotor blades is correct. 6. In the case of multi-rotor aircraft, the rigging and movement of the rotor blades are synchronized. 7. When taps are provided on main rotor blades, they are correctly set. 8. The neutral, maximum, and minimum pitch angles and coning angles of the tail rotor blades are correct. 9. When dual controls are provided, they function correctly and in synchronization. Upon completion of rigging, a thorough check should be made of all attaching, securing, and pivot points. All bolts, nuts, and rod ends should be properly secured and safety as specified in the manufacturer's maintenance and service instructions. Configurations of rotary wing aircraft. Autogyro. An autogyro is an aircraft with a free-spinning horizontal rotor that turns due to passage of air upward through the rotor. This air motion is created from forward motion of the aircraft resulting from either a tractor or pusher configured engine slash propeller design. Figure 224. Single rotor helicopter. An aircraft with a single horizontal main rotor that provides both lift and direction of travel is a single rotor helicopter. A secondary rotor mounted vertically on the tail counteracts the rotational force torque of the main rotor to correct yaw of the fuselage. Figure 225. Figure 224. An auto gyro. Figure 225. Single rotor helicopter. 217. Dual rotor helicopter. An aircraft with two horizontal rotors that provide both the lift and directional control is a dual rotor helicopter. The rotors are counter rotating to balance the aerodynamic torque and eliminate the need for a separate anti torque system. Figure 226. Types of rotor systems. Fully articulated rotor. A fully articulated rotor is found on aircraft with more than two blades and allows movement of each individual blade in three directions. In this design, each blade can rotate about the pitch axis to change lift. Each blade can move back and forth in plane, lead and lag, and flap up and down through a hinge independent of the other blades. Figure 227. Figure 226. Dual rotor helicopter. Pitch change axis. Flipping hinge drag hinge. Semi-rigid rotor. The semi-rigid rotor design is found on aircraft with two rotor blades. 
the blades are connected in a manner such that as one blade flaps up, the opposite blade flaps down. Rigid Rotor The rigid rotor system is a rare design, but potentially offers the best properties of both the fully articulated and semi-rigid rotors. In this design, the blade roots are rigidly attached to the rotor hub. The blades do not have hinges to allow lead lag or flapping. Instead, the blades accommodate these motions by using elastomeric bearings. Elastomeric bearings are molded, rubber-like materials that are bonded to the appropriate parts. Instead of rotating like conventional bearings, they twist and flex to allow proper movement of the blades. Forces acting on the helicopter. One of the differences between a helicopter and a fixed-wing aircraft is the main source of lift. The fixed-wing aircraft derives its lift from a fixed airfoil surface, while the helicopter derives lift from a rotating airfoil called the rotor. During hovering flight in a no-wind condition, the tip path plane is horizontal, that is, parallel to the ground. Lift and thrust act straight up, weight and drag act straight down. The sum of the lift and thrust forces must equal the sum of the weight and drag forces in order for the helicopter to hover. During vertical flight in a no-wind condition, the lift and thrust forces both act vertically upward. Weight and drag both act vertically downward. When lift and thrust equal weight and drag, the helicopter hovers. If lift and thrust are less than weight and drag, the helicopter descends vertically. If lift and thrust are greater than weight and drag, the helicopter rises vertically. For forward flight, the tip pad plane is tilted forward, thus tilting the total lift thrust force forward from the vertical. This resultant lift thrust force can be resolved into two components. Lift acting vertically upward, and thrust acting horizontally in the direction of flight. In addition to lift and thrust, there is weight, the downward acting force, and drag, the rearward acting or retarding force of inertia and wind resistance. In straight and level, an accelerated forward flight, lift equals weight and thrust equals drag. Straight and level flight is flight with a constant heading, and at a constant altitude. If lift exceeds weight, the helicopter climbs. If lift is less than weight, the helicopter descends. If thrust exceeds drag, the helicopter increases speed. If thrust is less than drag, it decreases speed. Figure 227. Articulated rotor head. 218. In sideward flight, the tip path plane is tilted sideward in the direction that flight is desired, thus tilting the total lift thrust vector sideward. In this case, the vertical or lift component is still straight up, weight straight down, but the horizontal or thrust component now acts sideward with drag acting to the opposite side. For rearward flight, the tip path plane is tilted rearward, and tilts the lift thrust vector rearward. The thrust is then rearward, and the drag component is forward, opposite that for forward flight. The lift component in rearward flight is straight up, weight, straight down. Torque compensation. Newton's third law of motion states to every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. As the main rotor of a helicopter turns in one direction, the fuselage tends to rotate in the opposite direction. This tendency for the fuselage to rotate is called torque. Since torque effect on the fuselage is a direct result of engine power supplied to the main rotor, any change in engine power brings about a corresponding change in torque effect. The greater the engine power, the greater the torque effect. Since there is no engine power being supplied to the main rotor during auto rotation, there is no torque reaction during auto rotation. The force that compensates for torque and provides for directional control can be produced by various means. The defining factor is dictated by the design of the helicopter, some of which do not have a torque issue. Single main. Rotor designs typically have an auxiliary rotor located on the end of the tail boom. This auxiliary rotor, generally referred to as a tail rotor, reduces thrust in the direction opposite the torque reaction developed by the main rotor. Figure 225 foot pedals in the flight deck permit the pilot to increase or decrease tail rotor thrust, as needed, to neutralize torque effect. Other methods of compensating for torque and providing directional control include the Fenestron registered tail rotor system, a sud aviation design that employs a ducted fan enclosed by a shroud. Another design, called not a registered comma, a McDonnell Douglas design with no tail rotor, employs air directed through a series of slots in the tail boom, with the balance exiting through a 90 degrees duct located at the rear of the tail boom. Figure 228. Gyroscopic forces. The spinning main rotor of a helicopter acts like a gyroscope. As such, it has the properties of gyroscopic action, one of which is precession. Gyroscopic precession is the resultant action or deflection of a spinning object when the force is applied to this object. This action occurs approximately 90 degrees in the direction of rotation from the point where the force is applied. Figure 229 Through the use of this principle, the tip path plane of the main rotor may be tilted from the horizontal. Figure 228 The Rospadial Fenestron tail rotor system left and the McDonnell Douglas Nodder registered system right. 219 Axis new axis old axis. 90 Upward force applied here reaction occurs here gyro tips down here gyro tips up here. Figure 229 Gyroscopic precession principle. Examine a two-bladed rotor system to see how gyroscopic precession affects the movement of the tip path plane. 
Moving the cyclic pitch control increases the AOA of one rotor plate with the result that a greater lifting force is applied at that point in the plane of rotation. This same control movement simultaneously decreases the AOA of the other plate the same amount, thus decreasing the lifting force applied at that point in the plane of rotation. The blade with the increased AOA tends to flap up, the blade with the decreased AOA tends to flap down. Because the rotor disc acts like a gyro, the blades reach maximum deflection at a point approximately 90 degrees later in the plane of rotation. As shown in figure 230, the retreating blade AOA is increased, and the advancing blade AOA is decreased resulting in the tipping forward of the tip path plane, since maximum deflection takes place 90 degrees later when the blades are at the rear and front, respectively. In the rotor system using three or more blades, the movement of the cyclic pitch control changes the AOA of each blade an appropriate amount, so that the end result is the same. The movement of the cyclic pitch control in a two-bladed rotor system increases the AOA of one rotor blade with the result that a greater lifting force is applied at this point in the plane of rotation. This same control movement simultaneously decreases the AOA of the other blade a like amount, thus decreasing the lifting force applied at this point in the plane of rotation. The blade with the increased AOA tends to rise, the blade with the decreased AOA tends to lower. However, gyroscopic precession prevents the blades from rising or lowering to maximum deflection until a point approximately 90 degrees later in the plane of rotation. In the three-bladed rotor, the movement of the cyclic pitch control changes the AOA of each blade an appropriate amount, so that the end result is the same. A tipping forward of the tip path plane, when the maximum change in AOA is made as each blade passes the same points at which the maximum increase and decrease are made for the two-bladed rotor as shown in figure 230. As each blade passes the 90 degrees position on the left, the maximum increase in AOA occurs. As each blade passes the 90 degrees position to the right, the maximum decrease in AOA occurs. Maximum deflection takes place 90 degrees later, maximum upward deflection at the rear and maximum downward deflection at the front, the tip path plane tips forward. Helicopter flight conditions. Hovering flight. During hovering flight, a helicopter maintains a constant position over a selected point, usually a few feet above the ground. For a helicopter to hover, the lift and thrust produced by the rotor system acts straight up, and must equal the weight and drag, which acts straight down. Figure 231 While hovering, the amount of main rotor thrust can be changed to maintain the desired hovering altitude. This is done by changing the angle of incidence, by moving the collective of the rotor blades, and hence the AOA of the main rotor blades. Changing the AOA changes the drag on the rotor blades, and the power delivered by the engine must change as well to keep the rotor speed constant. The weight that must be supported is the total weight of the helicopter and its occupants. If the amount of lift is greater, 220. Low pitch of flight blade rotation. High flap result. Low flap result. Blade rotation. High pitch of flight. Figure 230. Gyroscopic precession. In the actual weight, the helicopter accelerates upwards until the lift force equals the weight gain altitude. If thrust is less than weight, the helicopter accelerates downward. When operating near the ground, the effect of the closeness to the ground changes this response. Thrust. Lift. Weight. Drag. The drag of a hovering helicopter is mainly induced drag incurred, while the blades are producing lift. There is, however, some profile drag on the blades as they rotate through the air. Throughout the rest of this discussion, the term drag includes both induced and profile drag. An important consequence of producing thrust is torque. As discussed earlier, Newton's third law states that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. Therefore, as the engine turns the main rotor system in a counterclockwise direction, the helicopter fuselage tends to turn clockwise. The amount of torque is directly related to the amount of engine power being used to turn the main rotor system. Remember, as power changes, torque changes. To counteract this torque-induced turning tendency, an anti-torque rotor or tail rotor is incorporated into most helicopter designs. A pilot can vary the amount of thrust produced by the tail rotor in relation to the amount of torque produced by the engine. As the engine supplies more power to the main rotor, the tail rotor must produce more thrust to overcome the increased torque effect. This is done through the use of anti-torque pedals. Figure 231. To maintain a hover at a constant altitude, enough lift and thrust must be generated to equal the weight of the helicopter and the drag produced by the rotor blades. 221. Translating tendency or drift. During hovering flight, a single main rotor helicopter tends to drift or move in the direction of tail rotor thrust. This drifting tendency is called translating tendency. Figure 232. To counteract this drift, one or more of the following features may be used. All examples are for a counterclockwise rotating main rotor system. The main transmission is mounted at a slight angle to the left when viewed from behind, so that the rotor mast has a built-in tilt to oppose the tail rotor thrust. Flight controls can be rigged, so that the rotor disc is tilted to the right slightly when the cyclic is centered. Whichever method is used, the tip path plane is tilted slightly to the left in the hover. 
if the transmission is mounted, so the rotor shaft is vertical with respect to the fuselage, the helicopter and left skid low in the hover. The opposite is true for rotor systems turning clockwise when viewed from above. In forward flight, the tail rotor continues to push to the right, and the helicopter makes a small angle with the wind, when the rotors are level and the slip ball is in the middle. This is called inherent side slip. Ground effect. When hovering near the ground, a phenomenon known as ground effect takes place. This effect usually occurs at heights between the surface and approximately one rotor diameter above the surface. The friction of the ground causes the downwash from the rotor to move outwards from the helicopter. This changes the relative direction of the blade rotation, torque, drift, torque, blade rotation, tail rotor downwash, tail rotor thrust, figure 232. A tail rotor is designed to produce thrust in a direction opposite torque. The thrust produced by the tail rotor is sufficient to move the helicopter laterally. Downwash from a purely vertical motion to a combination of vertical and horizontal motion. As the induced airflow through the rotor disc is reduced by the surface friction, the lift vector increases. This allows a lower rotor blade angle for the same amount of lift, which reduces induced drag. Ground effect also restricts the generation of blade tip vortices due to the downward and outward airflow making a larger portion of the blade produce lift. When the helicopter gains altitude vertically, with no forward airspeed, induced airflow is no longer restricted, and the blade tip vortices increase with the decrease in outward airflow. As a result, drag increases which means a higher pitch angle, and more power is needed to move the air down through the rotor. Ground effect is at its maximum in a no-wind condition over a firm, smooth surface. Tall grass, rough terrain, and water surfaces alter the airflow pattern, causing an increase in rotor tip vortices. Figure 233. Coriolis effect law of conservation of angular momentum. The Coriolis effect is also referred to as the law of conservation of angular momentum. It states that the value of angular momentum of a rotating body does not change unless an external force is applied. In other words, a rotating body continues to rotate with the same rotational velocity until some external force is applied to change the speed of rotation. Angular momentum is moment of inertia mass times distance from the center of rotation squared multiplied by speed of rotation. Changes in angular velocity, known as angular acceleration and deceleration, take place as the mass of a rotating body is moved closer to or further away from the axis of rotation. The speed of the rotating mass increases or decreases in proportion to the square of the radius. An excellent example of this principle is a spinning ice skater. The skater begins rotation on one foot, with the other leg and both arms extended. The rotation of the skater's body is relatively slow. When the skater draws both arms and one leg inward, the moment of inertia mass times radius squared becomes much smaller, and the body is rotating almost faster than the eye can follow. Because the angular momentum must remain constant no external force applied, the angular velocity must increase. The rotor blade rotating about the rotor hub possesses angular momentum. As the rotor begins to cone due to G-loading maneuvers, the diameter or the disc shrinks. Due to conservation of angular momentum, the blades continue to travel the same speed, even though the blade tips have a shorter distance to travel due to reduced disc diameter. The action results in an increase in rotor RPM. Most pilots arrest this increase with an increase in collective pitch. Inversely, as G-loading subsides and the rotor disc flattens out from the loss of G-load induced coning, the blade tips now have a longer distance to travel at the same. 222. Out of ground effect OG and ground effect IG. Large blade tip vortex. No wind hover. Blade tip vortex. Downwash pattern equidistant 360 degrees. Figure 233. Air circulation patterns change when hovering out of ground effect OG and when hovering in ground effect IG. Tip speed. This action results in a reduction of rotor RPM. However, if this drop in the rotor RPM continues to the point at which it attempts to decrease below normal operating RPM, the engine control system adds more fuel slash power to maintain the specified engine RPM. If the pilot does not reduce collective pitch as the disc unloads, the combination of engine compensation for the RPM slows down, and the additional pitch as G-loading increases may result in exceeding the torque limitations or power the engines can produce. Vertical flight. Hovering is actually an element of vertical flight. Increasing the AOA of the rotor blade's pitch, while keeping their rotation speed constant generates additional lift and the helicopter ascends. Decreasing the pitch causes the helicopter to descend. In the no-wind condition, when lift and thrust are less than weight and drag, the helicopter descends vertically. If lift and thrust are greater than weight and drag, the helicopter ascends vertically. Figure 234. Forward flight. In steady forward flight with no change in airspeed or vertical speed, the four forces of lift, thrust, drag, and weight must be in balance. Once the tip path plane is tilted forward, the total lift thrust force is also tilted forward. This resultant lift thrust force can be resolved into two components lift acting vertically upward, and thrust acting horizontally in the direction of flight. In addition to lift and thrust, there is weight the downward acting force, and drag the force opposing the motion of an airfoil through the air. 
Figure 235. Resultant. Lift. Vertical ascent. Thrust. Lift. Thrust. Weight. Drag. Figure 234. To ascend vertically, more lift and thrust must be generated to overcome the forces of weight and drag. Drag. Helicopter movement. Weight. Resultant. Figure 235. The power required to maintain a straight and level flight and a stabilized airspeed. 223. And straight and level constant heading and at a constant altitude. An accelerated forward flight. Lift equals weight and thrust equals drag. If lift exceeds weight, the helicopter accelerates vertically until the forces are in balance. If thrust is less than drag, the helicopter slows until the forces are in balance. As the helicopter moves forward, it begins to lose altitude, because lift is lost as thrust is diverted forward. However, as the helicopter begins to accelerate, the rotor system becomes more efficient due to the increased airflow. The result is excess power over that which is required to hover. Continued acceleration causes an even larger increase in airflow through the rotor disc and more excess power. In order to maintain an accelerated flight, the pilot must not make any changes in power or in cyclic movement. Any such changes would cause the helicopter to climb or descend. Once straight and level flight is obtained, the pilot should make note of the power torque setting required and not make major adjustments to the flight controls. Figure 236. Translational lift. Improved rotor efficiency resulting from directional flight is called translational lift. The efficiency of the hovering rotor system is greatly improved with each knot of incoming wind gained by horizontal movement of the aircraft or surface wind. As incoming wind produced by aircraft movement or surface wind enters the rotor system, turbulence and vortices are left behind, and the flow of air becomes more horizontal. In addition, the tail rotor becomes more aerodynamically efficient during the transition from hover to forward flight. Translational thrust occurs when the tail rotor becomes more aerodynamically efficient during the transition from hover to forward flight. As the tail rotor works in progressively less turbulent air, this improved efficiency produces more anti-torque thrust, causing the nose of the aircraft to yaw left with the main rotor turning counterclockwise and forces the 800. Maximum continuous power available. 600. Increasing power for decreasing airspeed. Hover Oge. Power required horsepower. 2. C. A B. 400. Power required. Increasing power for decreasing airspeed. 200. Minimum power for level flight VY close parent. Maximum continuous level horizontal flight airspeed VH close parent. 0. 0 40 60 80 100 120. Indicated airspeed Kias. Figure 236. Changing force vectors results in aircraft movement. Pilot to apply right pedal decreasing the AOA in the tail rotor blades in response. In addition, during this period, the airflow affects the horizontal components of the stabilizer found on most helicopters which tends to bring the nose of the helicopter to a more level attitude. Figure 237 and Figure 238 show airflow patterns at different speeds, and how airflow affects the efficiency of the tail rotor. Effective translational lift ETL. While transitioning to forward flight at about 1624 knots, the helicopter experiences effective translational lift ETL. As mentioned earlier in the discussion on translational lift, 1-5 knots of air, downward velocity, molecules used by aft section, of, rotor, figure 237, the airflow pattern for 1-5 knots of forward airspeed, note how the downwind vortex is beginning to dissipate, and induced flow down through the rear of the rotor system is more horizontal, 224, airflow pattern just prior to effective translational lift, 10-15 knots, figure 238, an airflow pattern at a speed of 10-15 knots, at this increased airspeed, the airflow continues to become more horizontal. The leading edge of the downwash pattern is being overrun, and is well back under the nose of the helicopter. The rotor blades become more efficient as forward airspeed increases. Between 16-24 knots, the rotor system completely outruns the recirculation of old vortices, and begins to work in relatively undisturbed air. The flow of air through the rotor system is more horizontal, therefore induced flow and induced drag are reduced. The AOA is subsequently increased, which makes the rotor system operate more efficiently. This increased efficiency continues with increased airspeed until the best climb airspeed is reached, and total drag is at its lowest point. As speed increases, translational lift becomes more effective, the nose rises or pitches up, and the aircraft rolls to the right. The combined effects of the symmetry of lift, gyroscopic precession, and transverse flow effect cause this tendency. It is important to understand these effects and anticipate correcting for them. Once the helicopter is transitioning through ETL, the pilot needs to apply forward and left lateral cyclic input to maintain a constant rotor disc attitude. Figure 239. More horizontal flow of air. No recirculation of air. 1624 knots. The symmetry of lift. The symmetry of lift is the differential unequal lift between advancing and retreating halves of the rotor disc caused by the different wind flow velocity across each half. 
This difference in lift would cause the helicopter to be uncontrollable in any situation other than hovering in a calm wind. There must be a means of compensating, correcting, or eliminating this unequal lift to attain symmetry of lift. When the helicopter moves through the air, the relative airflow through the main rotor disc is different on the advancing side than on the retreating side. The relative wind encountered by the advancing blade is increased by the forward speed of the helicopter, while the relative wind speed acting on the retreating blade is reduced by the helicopter's forward airspeed. Therefore, as a result of the relative wind speed, the advancing blade side of the rotor disc produces more lift than the retreating blade side. Figure 240. If this condition was allowed to exist, a helicopter with a counterclockwise main rotor blade rotation would roll to the left, because of the difference in lift. In reality, the main rotor blades flap and feather automatically, to equalize lift across the rotor disc. Articulated rotor systems, usually with three or more blades, incorporate a horizontal hinge flapping hinge to allow the individual rotor blades to move, or flap up and down as they rotate. A semi-rigid rotor system two blades utilizes a teetering hinge, which allows the blades, to flap as a unit. When one blade flaps up, the other blade flaps down. Reduced induced flow increases angle of attack. Tail rotor operates in relatively clean air. Figure 239. Effective translational lift is easily recognized in actual flight by a transient induced aerodynamic vibration and increased performance of the helicopter. 225. Direction of flight. Retreating side advancing side. Blade rotation. Relative wind. Blade tip speed minus helicopter speed 200 knots. Blade tip speed plus helicopter speed 400 knots. Relative wind. Blade rotation. Forward flight at 100 knots. Figure 240. The blade tip speed of this helicopter is approximately 300 knots. If the helicopter is moving forward at 100 knots, the relative wind speed on the advancing side is 400 knots. On the retreating side, it is only 200 knots. This difference in speed causes a dissymmetry of lift. As the rotor blade reaches the advancing side of the rotor disc, it reaches its maximum upward flapping velocity. Figure 241A When the blade flaps upward, the angle between the cord line and the resultant relative wind decreases. This decreases the AOA, which reduces the amount of lift produced by the blade. At position C, the rotor blade is at its maximum downward flapping velocity. Due to downward flapping, the angle between the cord line and the resultant relative wind increases. This increases the AOA, and thus the amount of lift produced by the blade. The combination of blade flapping and slow relative wind acting on the retreating blade normally limits the maximum forward speed of a helicopter. At a high forward speed, the retreating blade stalls due to high AOA and slow relative wind speed. This situation is called retreating blade stall, and is evidenced by a nose-up pitch, vibration, and a rolling tendency usually to the left in helicopters with counterclockwise blade rotation. Pilots can avoid retreating blade stall by not exceeding the never exceed speed. This speed is designated VNE, and is indicated on the placard, and marked on the airspeed indicator by a red line. During aerodynamic flapping of the rotor blades as they compensate for the symmetry of lift, the advancing blade achieves maximum upward flapping displacement over the nose and maximum downward flapping displacement over the tail. This causes the tip path plane to tilt to the rear, and is referred to as blowback. Figure 242 shows how the rotor, the angle of attack over nose, board line, resultant relative wind, blade rotation, C, B, C angle of attack at 9 o'clock position, board line, A, down flap velocity, Resultant relative wind. The angle of attack at 3 o'clock position. Board line. Resultant relative wind. Up flap velocity. D. Relative wind angle of attack. D angle of attack over tail. Board line. Resultant relative wind. Figure 241. The combined upward flapping reduced lift of the advancing blade and downward flapping increased lift of the retreating blade equalizes lift across the main rotor disc counteracting the symmetry of lift. 226. Figure 242. To compensate for blowback, move the cyclic forward. Blowback is more pronounced with higher air speeds. Disc is originally oriented with the front down following the initial cyclic input. As air speed is gained, and flapping eliminates the symmetry of lift, the front of the disc comes up, and the back of the disc goes down. This reorientation of the rotor disc changes the direction in which total rotor thrust acts. The helicopter's forward speed slows, but can be corrected with cyclic input. The pilot uses cyclic feathering, to compensate for the symmetry of lift allowing him or her to control the attitude of the rotor disc. Cyclic feathering compensates for the symmetry of lift changes the AOA in the following way. At a hover, equal lift is produced around the rotor system with equal pitch and AOA on all the blades, and at all points in the rotor system disregarding compensation for translating tendency. The rotor disc is parallel to the horizon. To develop a thrust force, the rotor system must be tilted in the desired direction of movement. Cyclic feathering changes the angle of incidence differentially around the rotor system. Forward cyclic movements decrease the angle of incidence at one part on the rotor system, while increasing the angle at another part. 
maximum downward flapping of the blade over the nose and maximum upward flapping over the tail tilt both rotor disc and thrust vector forward. To prevent blowback from occurring, the pilot must continually move the cyclic forward as the velocity of the helicopter increases. Figure 242 illustrates the changes in pitch angle as the cyclic is moved forward at increased air speeds. At a hover, the cyclic is centered, and the pitch angle on the advancing and retreating blades is the same. At low forward speeds, moving the cyclic forward reduces pitch angle on the advancing blade, and increases pitch angle on the retreating blade. This causes a slight rotor tilt. At higher forward speeds, the pilot must continue to move the cyclic forward. This further reduces pitch angle on the advancing blade, and further increases pitch angle on the retreating blade. As a result, there is even more tilt to the rotor than at lower speeds. This horizontal lift component thrust generates higher helicopter airspeed. The higher airspeed induces blade flapping to maintain symmetry of lift. The combination of flapping and cyclic feathering maintains symmetry of lift and desired attitude on the rotor system and helicopter. Auto rotation. Auto rotation is the state of flight in which the main rotor system of a helicopter is being turned by the action of air moving up through the rotor rather than engine power driving the rotor. Figure 243 in normal, powered flight, air is drawn into the main rotor system from above and exhausted downward, but during auto rotation, air moves up into the rotor system from below as the helicopter descends. Auto rotation is permitted mechanically by a freewheeling unit, which is a special clutch mechanism that allows the main rotor to continue turning, even if the engine is not running. If the engine fails, the freewheeling. Normal powered flight auto rotation. Direction of flight. Direction of flight. Figure 243. During an auto rotation, the upward flow of relative wind permits the main rotor blades to rotate at their normal speed. In effect, the blades are gliding in their rotational plane. 227. Unit automatically disengages the engine from the main rotor allowing the main rotor to rotate freely. It is the means by which a helicopter can be landed safely in the event of an engine failure. Consequently, all helicopters must demonstrate this capability in order to be certificated. Rotorcraft controls. Slush plate assembly. The purpose of the slush plate is to transmit control inputs from the collective and cyclic controls to the main rotor plates. It consists of two main parts, the stationary slush plate and the rotating slush plate. Figure 244. The stationary slush plate is mounted around the main rotor mast and connected to the cyclic and collective controls by a series of push rods. It is restrained from rotating by an anti-drive link, but is able to tilt in all directions and move vertically. The rotating slush plate is mounted to the stationary slush plate by a nibble sleeve. It is connected to the mast by drive links and is allowed to rotate with the main rotor mast. Both slush plates tilt and slide up and down as one unit. The rotating slush plate is connected to the pitch horns by the pitch links. There are three major controls in the helicopter that the pilot must use during flight. They are the collective pitch control, cyclic pitch control, and anti-torque pedals or tail rotor control. In addition to these major controls, the pilot must also use the pitch link, stationary slush plate, rotating slush plate, control rod, Figure 244. Stationary and rotating slush plate. Throttle control, which is mounted directly to the collective pitch control in order to fly the helicopter. Collective pitch control. The collective pitch control is located on the left side of the pilot's seat and is operated with the left hand. The collective is used to make changes to the pitch angle of all the main rotor blades simultaneously, or collectively, as the name implies. As the collective pitch control is raised, there is a simultaneous and equal increase in pitch angle of all main rotor blades. As it is lowered, there is a simultaneous and equal decrease in pitch angle. Figure 245 This is done through a series of mechanical linkages, and the amount of movement in the collective lever determines the amount. Figure 245 Raising the collective pitch control increases the pitch angle by the same amount on all blades. 228 Of blade pitch change An adjustable friction control helps prevent inadvertent collective pitch movement. Throttle control. The function of the throttle is to regulate engine RPM. If the correlator or governor system does not maintain the desired RPM when the collective is raised or lowered, or if those systems are not installed, the throttle must be moved manually with the twist grip to maintain RPM. The throttle control is much like a motorcycle throttle, and works almost the same way. Twisting the throttle to the left increases RPM. Twisting the throttle to the right decreases RPM. Figure 246. Governor slash correlator. A governor is a sensing device that senses rotor and engine RPM and makes the necessary adjustments in order to keep rotor RPM constant. Once the rotor RPM is set in normal operations, the governor keeps the RPM constant, and there is no need to make any throttle adjustments. Governors are common on all turbine helicopters as it is a function of the fuel control system of the turbine engine, and used on some piston-powered helicopters. A correlator is a mechanical connection between the collective lever and the engine throttle. When the collective lever is raised, power is automatically increased and when lowered, power is decreased. 
This system maintains RPM close to the desired value, but still requires adjustment of the throttle for fine tuning. Some helicopters do not have correlators or governors and require coordination of all collective and throttle movements. When the collective is raised, the throttle must be increased. When the collective is lowered, the throttle must be decreased. As with any aircraft control, large adjustments of either collective pitch or throttle should be avoided. All corrections should be made with smooth pressure. In piston helicopters, the collective pitch is the primary control for manifold pressure, and the throttle is the primary control for RPM. However, the collective pitch control also influences RPM, and the throttle also influences manifold pressure, therefore, each is considered to be a secondary control of the other's function. Both the tachometer RPM indicator and the manifold pressure gauge must be analyzed to determine which control to use. Figure 247 illustrates this relationship. Cyclic pitch control. The cyclic pitch control is mounted vertically from the cockpit floor, between the pilot's legs or, in some models, between the two pilot seats. Figure 248 This primary flight control allows the pilot to fly the helicopter in any horizontal direction, fore, aft, and sideways. The total lift force is always perpendicular to the tip path place of the main rotor. The purpose of the cyclic pitch control is to tilt the tip path plane in the direction of the desired horizontal direction. The cyclic control changes the direction of this force and controls the attitude and airspeed of the helicopter. The rotor disc tilts in the same direction the cyclic pitch control is moved. If the cyclic is moved forward, the rotor disc tilts forward, if the cyclic is moved aft, the disc tilts aft, and so on. Because the rotor disc acts like a gyro, the mechanical linkages for the cyclic control rods are rigged in such a way that they decrease the pitch angle of the rotor blade approximately 90 degrees before it reaches the direction of cyclic displacement, and increase the pitch angle of the rotor blade approximately 90 degrees after it passes the direction of displacement. An increase in pitch angle increases AOA, a decrease in pitch angle decreases AOA. For example, if the cyclic is moved forward, the AOA decreases as the rotor blade passes the right side of the helicopter and increases on the left side. This results in maximum downward deflection of the if manifold pressure is twist grip throttle and RPM is low low high low low high 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 solution increasing the throttle increases manifold pressure and RPM lowering the collective pitch decreases manifold pressure and increases RPM raising the collective pitch increases manifold pressure and decreases RPM reducing the throttle decreases manifold pressure and RPM figure 246 a twist grip throttle is usually mounted on the end of the collective lever. The throttles on some turbine helicopters are mounted on the overhead panel or on the floor in the cockpit. Figure 247. Relationship between manifold pressure, RPM, collective, and throttle. 229. Cyclic pitch control. Cyclic pitch control. Figure 249. Anti-torque pedals compensate for changes in torque and control heading in the hover. Figure 248. The cyclic pitch control may be mounted vertically between the pilot's knees or on the teetering bar from a single cyclic located in the center of the helicopter. The cyclic can pivot in all directions. Rotor blade in front of the helicopter and maximum upward deflection behind it, causing the rotor disc to tilt forward. Anti-torque pedals. The anti-torque pedals are located on the cabin floor by the pilot's feet. They control the pitch and, therefore, the thrust of the tail rotor blades. Figure 249 Newton's third law applies to the helicopter fuselage and how it rotates in the opposite direction of the main rotor blades, unless counteracted and controlled. To make flight possible and to compensate for this torque, most helicopter designs incorporate an anti-torque rotor or tail rotor. The anti-torque pedals allow the pilot to control the pitch angle of the tail rotor blades which in forward flight puts the helicopter in longitudinal trim and while at a hover enables the pilot to turn the helicopter 360 degrees. The anti-torque pedals are connected to the pitch change mechanism on the tail rotor gearbox and allow the pitch angle on the tail rotor blades to be increased or decreased. Helicopters that are designed with tandem rotors do not have an anti-torque rotor. These helicopters are designed with both rotor systems rotating in opposite directions to counteract the torque, rather than using a tail rotor. Directional anti-torque pedals are used for directional control of the aircraft while in flight, as well as while taxiing with the forward gear off the ground. With the right pedal displaced forward, the forward rotor disc tilts to the right, while the aft rotor disc tilts to the left. The opposite occurs when the left pedal is pushed forward, the forward rotor disc inclines to the left, and the aft rotor disc tilts to the right. Differing combinations of pedal and cyclic application can allow the tandem rotor helicopter to pivot about the after forward vertical axis, as well as pivoting about the center of mass. Stabilizer systems. Bell stabilizer bar system. Arthur M. Young discovered that stability could be increased significantly with the addition of a stabilizer bar perpendicular to the two plates. 
The stabilizer bar is weighted ends, which cause it to stay relatively stable in the plane of rotation. The stabilizer bar is linked with the swash plate in a manner that reduces the pitch rate. The two blades can flap as a unit and, therefore, do not require lag lead hinges the whole rotor slows down and accelerates per turn. Two-bladed systems require a single teetering hinge and two coning hinges to permit modest coning of the rotor disc as thrust is increased. The configuration is known under multiple names, including pillar panels, pillar system, bell pillar system, and fly bar system. 230. Offset flapping hinge. The offset flapping hinge is offset from the center of the rotor up and can produce powerful moments useful for controlling the helicopter. The distance of the hinge from the up the offset multiplied by the force produced at the hinge produces a moment at the up. Obviously, the larger the offset, the greater the moment for the same force produced by the blade. The flapping motion is the result of the constantly changing balance between lift, centrifugal, and inertial forces. This rising and falling of the blades is characteristic of most helicopters and has often been compared to the beating of a bird's wing. The flapping hinge, together with the natural flexibility found in most blades, permits the blade to droop considerably when the helicopter is at rest and the rotor is not turning over. During flight, the necessary rigidity is provided by the powerful centrifugal force that results from the rotation of the blades. This force pulls outward from the tip, stiffening the blade, and is the only factor that keeps it from folding up. Stability Augmentation Systems SAS Some helicopters incorporate Stability Augmentation Systems SAS to help stabilize the helicopter in flight and in the hover. The simplest of these systems is a force trim system, which uses a magnetic clutch and springs to hold the cyclic control in the position at which it was released. More advanced systems use electric actuators that make inputs to the hydraulic servos. These servos receive control commands from a computer that senses helicopter attitude. Other inputs, such as heading, speed, altitude, and navigation information may be supplied to the computer to form a complete autopilot system. The SAS may be overridden or disconnected by the pilot at any time. SAS reduces pilot workload by improving basic aircraft control harmony and decreasing disturbances. These systems are very useful when the pilot is required to perform other duties, such as sling loading and search and rescue operations. Helicopter Vibration The following paragraphs describe the various types of vibrations. Figure 250 shows the general levels into which frequencies are divided. Helicopter Vibration Types Frequency Level Extreme Low Frequency Low Frequency Medium Frequency High Frequency Vibration Less than 1 slash rev pylon rock 1 slash rev or 2 slash rev type vibration generally 4, 5, or 6 slash rev tail rotor speed or faster. Extreme low frequency vibration. Extreme low frequency vibration is pretty well limited to pylon rock. Pylon rocking 2 to 3 cycles per second is inherent with the rotor, mast, and transmission system. To keep the vibration from reaching noticeable levels, transmission mount dampening is incorporated to absorb the rocking. Low frequency vibration. Low frequency vibrations 1 slash rev and 2 slash rev are caused by the rotor itself. 1 slash rev vibrations are of two basic types, vertical or lateral. A 1 slash rev is caused simply by one blade developing more lift at a given point than the other blade develops at the same point. Medium frequency vibration. Medium frequency vibration 4 slash rev and 6 slash rev is another vibration inherent in most rotors. An increase in the level of these vibrations is caused by a change in the capability of the fuselage to absorb vibration or a loose airframe component such as the skids, vibrating at that frequency. High frequency vibration. High frequency vibrations can be caused by anything in the helicopter that rotates or vibrates at extremely high speeds. A high frequency vibration typically occurs when the tail rotor gears, tail drive shaft or the tail rotor engine, fan or shaft assembly vibrates or rotates at an equal or greater speed than the tail rotor. Rotor blade tracking. Blade tracking is the process of determining the positions of the tips of the rotor blade relative to each other while the rotor head is turning, and of determining the corrections necessary to hold these positions within certain tolerances. The blades should all track one another as closely as possible. The purpose of blade tracking is to bring the tips of all blades into the same tip path throughout their entire cycle of rotation. Various methods of blade tracking are explained below. Flag and pull. The flag and pull method, as shown in figure 251, shows the relative positions of the rotor blades. The blade tips are marked with chalk or a grease pencil. Each blade tip should be marked with a different color so that it is easy to determine the relationship of the other tips of the rotor blades to each other. This method can be used on all types of helicopters that do not have jet propulsion at the blade tips. Refer to the applicable maintenance manual for specific procedures. Figure 250. Various helicopter vibration types. 231. Curtain. Curtain. Leading edge. 70 degrees to 80 degrees. Blade. Pole handle. Blade. Pole. Position of chalk mark approximately 2 inches long. Line parallel to longitudinal axis of helicopter. Curtain. 1 slash 2 max spread typical. 
Approximate position of chalk marks. Hole. Figure 251. Flag and pole blade tracking. Electronic blade tracker. The most common electronic blade tracker consists of a balancer slash phaser, strobex tracker, and vibrex tester. Figures 252 through 254 The Strobex Blade Tracker permits blade tracking from inside or outside the helicopter, while on the ground or inside the helicopter in flight. The system uses a highly concentrated light beam flashing in sequence with the rotation of the main rotor blades, so that a fixed target at the blade tips appears to be stopped. Each blade is identified by an elongated retroreflective number taped or attached to the underside of the blade in a uniform location. When viewed at an angle from inside the helicopter, the taped numbers will appear normal. Tracking can be accomplished with tracking tip cap reflectors and a strobe light. The tip. Strobe flash 2 RPM dial. Meter. A channel P. A B. Track. Common. Magnetic pickup. Function. Balancer. Model 177M6A. Band pass filter. RPM tone. RPM. Strobe X model 135M11. X1. X10. X100. Push for scale 2. RPM range. Phase meter. Double. Test. 11. 12. 10. 1. 2. Phaser. 9. 3. 8. 4. 7. 5. 6. Figure 252. Balancer slash phaser. 232. Figure 253. Strobex tracker. Caps are temporarily attached to the tip of each blade. The high intensity strobe light flashes in time with the rotating blades. The strobe light operates from the aircraft electrical power supply. By observing the reflected tip cap image, it is possible to view the track of the rotating blades. Tracking is accomplished in a sequence of four separate steps. Ground tracking, hover verification, forward flight tracking, and auto-rotation RPM adjustment. Tail rotor tracking. The marking and electronic methods of tail rotor tracking are explained in the following paragraphs. Marking method. Procedures for tail rotor tracking using the marking method, as shown in figure 255, are as follows. After replacement or installation of tail rotor hub, blades, or pitch change system, check tail rotor rigging and track tail rotor blades. Tail rotor tip clearance shall be set, before tracking and checked again after tracking. The strobe type tracking device may be used if available. Instructions for use are provided with the device. Attach a piece of soft rubber hose 6 inches long on the end of a one half times one half inch pine stick or other flexible device. Cover the rubber hose with brush and blue, or similar type of coloring thinned with oil. Note. Ground run-up shall be performed by authorized personnel only. Start engine in accordance with applicable. Maintenance manual. Run engine with pedals in neutral position. Reset marking device on underside of tail boom assembly. Slowly move marking device into disc of tail rotor approximately one inch from tip. When near blade is marked, stop engine and allow rotor to stop. Repeat this procedure until tracking mark crosses over to the other blade, then extend pitch control link of unmarked blade one half turn. Electronic method. The electronic Vibrex balancing and tracking kit is housed in a carrying case, and consists of a Model 177M6A balancer, a Model 135M11 Strobex, track and balance charts, an accelerometer, cables, and attaching brackets. The Vibrex balancing kit is used to measure and indicate the level of vibration induced by the main rotor and tail rotor of a helicopter. The Vibrex analyzes the vibration induced by out-of-track or out-of-balance rotors, and then by plotting vibration amplitude and clock angle on the chart the amount and location of rotor tracker weight change is determined. In addition, the Vibrex is used in troubleshooting by measuring the vibration levels and frequencies or RPM of unknown disturbances. Interrupter plate. Motor. Tester. Figure 255. Tail rotor tracking. Figure 254. Vibrex tracker. 233. Rotor blade preservation and storage. Accomplish the following requirements for rotor blade preservation and storage. Condemn, demilitarize, and dispose of locally any blade which has incurred non-repairable damage. Tape all holes in the blade, such as tree damage, or foreign object damage pod to protect the interior of the blade from moisture and corrosion. Thoroughly remove foreign matter from the entire exterior surface of blade with mild soap and water. Protect blade outboard eroded surfaces with a light coating of corrosion preventive or primer coating. Protect blade main bolt hole bushing, drag race retention bolt hole bushing, and any exposed bare metal i.e., grip and drag pads with a light coating of corrosion preventive. Secure blade to shock mounted support and secure container lid. Place copy of manufacturer's blade records, containing information required by Title 14 of the Code of Federal Regulations 14 CFR Section 91.417-2 i.e., and any other blade records in a waterproof bag and insert into container record 2. Obliterate old markings from the container that pertain to the original shipment or to the original item it contained. Annotate the blade model, art number P slash N and serial number, as applicable, on the outside of the container. Helicopter power systems. Power plant.
The two most common types of engines used in helicopters are the reciprocating engine and the turbine engine. Reciprocating engines, also called piston engines, are generally used in smaller helicopters. Most training helicopters use reciprocating engines because they are relatively simple and inexpensive to operate. Turbine engines are more powerful and are used in a wide variety of helicopters. They produce a tremendous amount of power for their size, but are generally more expensive to operate. Reciprocating engine. The reciprocating engine consists of a series of pistons connected to a rotating crankshaft. As the pistons move up and down, the crankshaft rotates. The reciprocating engine gets its name from the back and forth movement of its internal parts. The four-stroke engine is the most common type, and refers to the four different cycles the engine undergoes to produce power. Figure 256. Intake valve. Exhaust valve. Piston. Spark plug. Crankshaft connecting rod. 1. Intake 2. Compression. 3. Power 4. Exhaust. Figure 256. The arrows indicate the direction of motion of the crankshaft and piston during the four-stroke cycle. When the piston moves away from the cylinder head on the intake stroke, the intake valve opens and a mixture of fuel and air is drawn into the combustion chamber. As the cylinder moves back toward the cylinder head, the intake valve closes and the fuel-slash-air mixture is compressed. When compression is nearly complete, the spark plugs fire and the compressed mixture is ignited to begin the power stroke. The rapidly expanding gases from the control burning of the fuel-slash-air mixture drive the piston away from the cylinder head, thus providing power to rotate the crankshaft. The piston then moves back toward the cylinder head on the exhaust stroke, where the burnt gases are expelled through the opened exhaust valve. Even when the engine is operated at a fairly low speed, the four-stroke cycle takes place several hundred times each minute. In the four-cylinder engine, each cylinder operates on a different stroke. Continuous rotation of a crankshaft is maintained by the precise timing of the power strokes in each cylinder. 234. Turbine engine. The gas turbine engine mounted on most helicopters is made up of a compressor, combustion chamber, turbine, and accessory gearbox assembly. The compressor draws filtered air into the plenum chamber and compresses it. The compressed air is directed to the combustion section through discharge tubes, where atomized fuel is injected into it. The fuel-slash-air mixture is ignited and allowed to expand. This combustion gas is then forced through a series of turbine wheels causing them to turn. These turbine wheels provide power to both the engine compressor and the accessory gearbox. Power is provided to the main rotor and tail rotor systems through the freewheeling unit which is attached to the accessory gearbox power output gear shaft. The combustion gas is finally expelled through an exhaust outlet. Figure 257. Transmission System. The transmission system transfers power from the engine to the main rotor, tail rotor, and other accessories during normal flight conditions. The main components of the transmission system are the main rotor transmission, tail rotor drive system, clutch, and freewheeling unit. The freewheeling unit, or autorotative clutch, allows the main rotor transmission to drive the tail rotor drive shaft during auto rotation. Helicopter transmissions are normally lubricated and cooled with their own oil supply. A sight gauge is provided to check the oil level. Some transmissions have chip detectors located in the sump. These detectors are wired to warning lights located on the pilot's instrument panel that illuminate in the event of an internal problem. The chip detectors on modern helicopters have a burn-off capability and attempt to correct the situation without pilot action. If the problem cannot be corrected on its own, the pilot must refer to the emergency procedures for that particular helicopter. Main Rotor Transmission The primary purpose of the main rotor transmission is to reduce engine output RPM to optimum rotor RPM. This reduction is different for the various helicopters. As an example, suppose the engine RPM of a specific helicopter is 2700. A rotor speed of 450 RPM would require a 6-1 reduction. A 9-1 reduction would mean the rotor would turn at 300 RPM. Most helicopters use a dual needle tachometer or a vertical scale instrument to show both engine and rotor RPM or a percentage of engine and rotor RPM. The rotor RPM indicator normally is used only during clutch engagement to monitor rotor acceleration and an auto rotation to maintain RPM within prescribed limits. Figure 258. In helicopters with horizontally mounted engines, another purpose of the main rotor transmission is to change the axis of rotation from the horizontal axis of the engine to the vertical axis of the rotor shaft. Figure 259. Clutch. In a conventional airplane, the engine and propeller are directly connected. However, in a helicopter there is a different relationship between the engine and the rotor. Because of the greater weight of a rotor in relation to the power of the engine, as compared to the weight of a propeller and the power in an airplane, the rotor must be disconnected. Gearbox section. Centrifugal compression section turbine section combustion section. Exhaust air outlet compressor rotor. N2 rotor stator N1 rotor. Igniter plug. Air inlet. Fuel nozzle. Inlet air compressor discharge air combustion gases exhaust gases. Gear. Output shaft. 
combustion liner. Figure 257. Many helicopters use a turboshaft engine as shown above to drive the main transmission and rotor systems. The main difference between a turboshaft and a turbojet engine is that most of the energy produced by the expanding gases is used to drive a turbine, rather than producing thrust through the expulsion of exhaust gases. 235. 20. 15. ER. 10. 2. 3. 4. 25. 30. 1. 5. 5. R. RPM X 100. 35. 110 190 80 70 60 50 110 190 80 70 60 50 0 rotor engine 40 percent rpm percent rpm 120 110 60 50 105 70 40 rotor peeper turbinia 80 100 90 30 95 20 R 100 10 percent RPM P 110 0 120 NRNP 90 80 70 60 40 0 Figure 258 There are various types of dual needle tachometers, however, when the needles are superimposed or married, the ratio of the engine RPM is the same as the gear reduction ratio. Main rotor, anti-torque rotor, main transmission, the engine, gearbox. Figure 259. The main rotor transmission and gearbox reduce engine output RPM to optimum rotor RPM and change the axis of rotation of the engine output shaft to the vertical axis for the rotor shaft from the engine when the starter is engaged. A clutch allows the engine to be started and then gradually pick up the load of the rotor. On free turbine engines, no clutch is required as the gas producer turbine is essentially disconnected from the power turbine. When the engine is started, there is little resistance from the power turbine. This enables the gas producer turbine to accelerate the normal idle speed without the load of the transmission and rotor system dragging it down. As the gas pressure increases through the power turbine, the rotor blades begin to turn, slowly at first, and then gradually accelerate the normal operating RPM. On reciprocating helicopters, the two main types of clutches are the centrifugal clutch and the belt drive clutch. Centrifugal clutch. The centrifugal clutch is made up of an inner assembly and an outer drum. The inner assembly, which is connected to the engine drive shaft, consists of shoes lined with material similar to automotive brake linings. At low engine speeds, springs hold the shoes in, so there is no contact with the outer drum, which is attached to the transmission input shaft. As engine speed increases, centrifugal force causes the clutch shoes to move outward and begin sliding against the outer drum. The transmission input shaft begins to rotate, causing the rotor to turn, slowly at first, but increasing as the friction increases between the clutch shoes and transmission drum. As rotor speed increases, the rotor tachometer needle shows an increase by moving towards the engine tachometer needle. When the two needles are superimposed, the engine and the rotor are synchronized, indicating the clutch is fully engaged and there is no further slippage of the clutch shoes. Belt drive clutch. Some helicopters utilize a belt drive to transmit power from the engine to the transmission. A belt drive consists of a lower pulley attached to the engine, an upper pulley attached to the transmission input shaft, a belt or a series of V-belts, and some means of applying tension to the belts. The belts fit loosely over the upper and lower pulley when there is no tension on the belts. This allows the engine to be started without any load from the transmission. Once the engine is running, tension on the belts is gradually increased. When the rotor and engine tachometer needles are superimposed, the rotor and the engine are synchronized, and the clutch is then fully engaged. Advantages of this system include vibration isolation, simple maintenance, and the ability to start and warm up the engine without engaging the rotor. Freewheeling unit. Since lift and